The gifts I leave for you beneath the tree aren't about those that you cannot touch or see. No toys are meant for pointless play, but gifts to bless you every day. The gift of friendship, warm and true, is the one that I would leave for you. Good health and happiness and cheer to keep you smiling throughout the year. The gift of peace that comes from God with prayer to guide you each path you trod. When your heart has lost its song, the gift of hope to cheer you on. These are the gifts that I will leave for you. Welcome to the DuPont Park Church Streaming Service. We are so glad to have you this morning. You know, this season at its core is a celebration of life. We are so glad that you chose to celebrate with us this morning. Please don't forget to invite your friends. Bring them back here with you next week. Let us have a word of prayer. Father, because you died, before, just because you were born, you came to give up everything for us and then come back and have the nerve to die for us. We just thank you with a song in our hearts, a song of redemption, a song of hope and renewal. Please send your Holy Spirit down to us today in the various places that we're worshiping. Please remove all distractions so we can get the message, Lord, that you have just for us. We ask that you protect us throughout the week and bring us back next week to enjoy you even more. In Jesus' name, amen. Shabbat Shalom and happy Sabbath. And then let me say for the last time in 2020, Merry Christmas. It's the day after Christmas and we are together in God's presence in our virtual worship experience. God bless you. So glad that you joined us today. It is also the celebration of Kwanzaa that starts today, right through New Year's Day. Today is Umoja, which means unity. And tomorrow is Kuji Chagulia, which means self-determination. We enjoy this celebration as well in this very joyous season. We want to remind you that even on this last week of 2020, there are still things that are going on in our community. 
every morning, Monday through Friday, 6 o'clock a.m. to 6.15. It is strength for today, that time when we come together and we pray and testify and gain encouragement and strength in the Lord. On Tuesday, the last Tuesday of this year, we will celebrate and engage in Power Up Tuesday, where we pray and fast from our early rising until 12 noon, asking for God's deliverance, His help, His strength, and interceding on one another's behalf. And then for the last time in 2020, we will have Wednesday connect at 7 o'clock p.m. via our Zoom connection. You can call the church office or check the website for login information. God is a good God. The pandemic is still with us. Just want to remind you and encourage you to be safe, to be healthy, to be well, to follow all of the protocols to keep yourself safe. There are so many who are suffering and we do not want to add to the numbers and we want to also lift the burden on our frontline workers, especially our healthcare workers, paramedics, uh, firemen, police, everyone who is involved, caretakers, that we keep one another safe. Well, we want to talk about those who celebrated birthdays this week. We have a few. I want to let you know that uh, Sister Marjorie Taylor and Sister Teria Vines celebrated a birthday on December 22nd. And we say happy birthday to both of them. God bless you. We love you. We know God loves you more. And may you continue to prosper in his love and care. But on yesterday, December 25, which was Christmas Day, there were several who celebrated birthdays, Sister Mary Brandon, Sister Carol Watts, and Sister Minnie Taylor. And we want to say happy birthday to them also. And I also want to say happy birthday to Arlene's mother, my mother-in-law, Sister Aretha Thurman, who celebrated her birthday on Thursday, Christmas Eve, December 24. Love you, Mom, and happy birthday again to you. We just uh, continue to praise God for all that he's doing, but I want to also let you know there is a special birthday that will take place this week. On the 31st, New Year's Eve, Elder, our dear sister, Elder Alita Dixon, will celebrate a milestone birthday 90 years young. Hallelujah. Let's give her a hand clap. Praise God for what he has done in her life. She is vibrant and spry. And we thank God for what he's doing for our dear sister, Lena Dixon. Sister Dixon, we love you. And we know God loves you. And he continues to care for you and keep you. We celebrate you. And we celebrate what God is doing in your life. Continue to be healthy and continue to stay well and be blessed. Well, we didn't receive any uh, wedding anniversaries for this week, but I'm sure that somebody somewhere took advantage of this Christmas season and uh, took their vows of holy matrimony to you. We say happy anniversary and may God bless you. And for all those that I didn't call or talk about in terms of the birthday celebrations, we want to say happy birthday to you as well. Well, we thank God that, that he has given us another day and we're here to worship. And it is now time for all of our young people to come a little closer. And we give you this special message just for you. It is now time for the children's story. Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. So Mary didn't know that she was having a baby. So Mary um, was sitting on stairs and then Heavenly Father told Mary that she was going to have a baby. And so Joseph, he was going to Bethlehem with his wife Mary and she was pregnant with Jesus. They, they rode, rode a camel. A, they rode a boat. Well, maybe. Yeah. Maybe it was a camel. Maybe it was a horse. They ride it on a donkey. And when they got there, all the inns were full because tons of people were going to all these cities and, you know, there's lots of road traffic. There was no room in the inn, though. Um, they said all our rooms are full, but there is a stable you guys could sleep in. 
and that's where she had Jesus. Babies are normally born in the hospital, and he was not born in a hospital, he was born in a major. It's the place where animals live. There were sh sheep, camels, there are zebras and horses and cows and all those things. I don't think it'd be fun. It probably wouldn't be very clean. There would probably be lots and lots of bugs. Mm, I don't think it would be very comfy. It was made out of sticks and a huge star was above it to tell people to follow it and to go under it. That's where Jesus would be born. So the shepherds, they were out, you know, watching their sheep to make sure no wolves came and ate them. And um, an angel came down to them and they were all scared because imagine if you were in a field and all of a sudden like a bright white light and there's like a person floating down towards you. I imagine it would be pretty surprising. The an angel told them to not be afraid. Fear not. And told him that Jesus is going to be born. And so he wanted him to go see him. So why is it as uh, other people came to visit him? Why is mom brand him three gifts? Gold, mirth, and freaking strength. Gold trait to sense and mirth. He's special. And so it was a special day on that day. He's special because he's the key and he's very good. He made it so that we could repent and go to heaven again. And that he sacrificed, since he sacrificed our, his life for us to come down on earth, I feel like that he really loves all of us. And like, it's just amazing that he did that. Good morning and happy Sabbath DuPont Park family. I hope that everyone had a merry, merry Christmas. It's that time of year when we talk about resolutions as we go into a new year. And the top four resolutions that, that people have each and every year is number one, that they're gonna eat healthy. Number two is that they're going to exercise more. Number three is that they're gonna save money and spend less during the year. And then the fourth resolution is that they're gonna learn something new, perhaps a, a, another language or a new hobby. But I wanna throw in another resolution for all of us. And that is that we're gonna be faithful to God in the new year. As challenging as, 20, as the year 2020 was, let us pray that we can be faithful to God in the new year. He has brought us through a pandemic. He has brought us through all of the bad things that we experienced in this year, but we're right at the end. We praise God for his watch care over us. And let's be faithful in 2021. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your watch care over us during 2020. We're so thankful that you continue to be a faithful God, a true God, that you keep your promises, that you'll never leave us or forsake us. We pray, Lord, that when you come, that we will have lived our lives so that we will all be saved in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Here's how you can give. You can give online conveniently through credit or debit card at www.adventistgiving.org. You can also give online by going to the DuPont Park Church website at www.dupontpark.org. Click on the online giving button, create an account or give as a guest, and make sure you select DuPont Park Church as your donation recipient. You can also mail in your giving. You can send your checks, money orders, or cashier checks to DuPont Park Seventh-day Adventist Church, located at 3985 Massachusetts Avenue, Southeast, Washington, D.C., 20019. Attention, DPC TD. Thank you for your worship and continued support. The prophet Isaiah asks this question in the 40th chapter, beginning with verse 28. 
Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the earth, fainteth not nor is weary? Then he gives us this promise in verse 31. He simply says, those that wait, those that lean on, those that hold on to God, those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The reason we have made it to this point, coming to the end of this year, is because there is a God, our God, who has never left us alone. Let's approach his throne now as we lift up our voices together and intercede on one another's behalf. Loving God, humbly we bow before you at this time, thanking you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you for being our God and for calling us as your sons and your daughters every day of 2020 and every day of our lives, Lord, you have never failed us and you have never left us alone. In our darkest moment, in our darkest hours, Lord, you have been there and you have brought us through. We've come through the challenges of economic pressure and a pandemic, Lord, racial injustice and social upheaval and political turmoil and tension, but you are still God. You are still constant and you are still making a way out of no way. We praise you and we lift up our voices in thanksgiving to your holy and blessed name. We confess our sins, Father, because they are many. We, we have the desire to live for you and there is this, this, this will to follow you every step of the way. But Lord, too often, and we have to be uh, honest with ourselves, every day we find ourselves falling short. But hallelujah, we're so glad that Jesus Christ, who came as a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, who became a man who walked in Galilee, who healed the sick and, and, and he, he, he blessed the blind and taught those who were in despair and, and looking for hope and freedom. Father, you lifted up the masses, but more than that, Father, when you were lifted up on a cross through that selfless act, that act of sacrifice, we have been made free from sin when we call upon your holy name. So Lord, we confess, we claim your righteousness, we claim your sacrifice, we claim your victory as our victory, Lord, and we thank you that you are giving us life and you free us from the penalty of sin. Now, Lord, we draw closer to you because our needs are many. Father, our stress has risen to new levels, but bigger than any problem, bigger than any circumstance, Lord, you are able to handle it. There is nothing too big for our God. And so, Lord, we come before you now. We lay everything at your feet. Father, we ask that you will continue to bless us in the midst of this pandemic. We pray for safety. We pray for healing for those who are already impacted. And we pray that you will bless those whose hearts are heavy right now because of the loss of loved ones. I pray especially for the Trevelyan and Jackson family who are dealing with the loss of their loved one, Robert Trevelyan from COVID-19. Lord, I ask that you will comfort all who find themselves in this, this hard place. And Lord, that you will speak to them in a way that they know that you are their hope and strength. Lord, we continue to ask your blessings upon Sister Lula Craig and her recovery. So continue to remember Sister Annie Ruth Thomas. Lord, continue to keep Sister Veronica Chambliss in, 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 your, in the palm of your hands. Sister Susie Watson, Sandra Smith. Lord, Joseph and Gwendolyn Coleman. Lord, we lift them up. Lord, I pray for Sister Linda Artis and her family, her niece, Shanette, who lost her son, Shandon Wilson, who was killed in a motorcycle accident, just 19 years old. 
Lord, we pray that you'll bring comfort to that family and, and bless their hearts and mend their broken spirits, Lord, and, and let them know that when we have our trust and hope in you, that a better day is coming. We continue to pray for our children, our youth, our school, our students, our scholars, our teachers, our principal, our conference, Lord, the church at large all over the globe. Lord, we lift up our voices in petition on behalf of, of our country. We ask, Lord, that you will continue to have your way. We are not fooled. We know that all of the steps are ordered by you and nothing happens without your permission. Father, we simply pray that you will help us to remain steadfast and to remain faithful as we go through. You warned us that these are the beginnings of sorrows. But in the end, we already know the end of the story. Victory is ours. One day soon and very soon, he that will come, will come. And we will look and behold him coming in the clouds of glory. Father, we ask that you will just keep us and hold us and help us to be faithful, to be ready to meet you in the clouds of glory when you come again. Father, for those things that we should have prayed for but failed to ask, we simply uh, uh, plead your heart of love and compassion upon us. And Lord, keep us safe, healthy, whole, encourage but most of all faithful and when we see you we want to hear you simply say to us well done good and faithful servant enter now into the joy of your lord let that be our miracle we pray in the name of the father in the name of the son and in the name of the holy spirit we say amen and praise god from whom all blessings flow
the Lord and greatly to be praised. Certainly, family, this is the day that the Lord has made. We should rejoice and be glad in it. Our rejoicing should not just be because Christmas was just yesterday. It should not be because we've just had some good food and some good times. But we should be rejoicing because this season is a reminder to us of the reason for this season, which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Emmanuel, God with us, who would save us from our sins. Happy belated Christmas Day. I'm excited to be here with you all today to share with you one more message during this Advent season as we together reflect on the birth of Jesus Christ. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1? Matthew chapter 1. We'll begin in verse 18 and we will end at the end of the chapter. Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. The Bible says, The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way after his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph. It was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him suddenly in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now, all this took place to fulfill what had was spoken by the prophet See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When, when Joseph got up from his sleeping, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He married Mary, but did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son, and he named that Son, Jesus. For the next few moments, I'd like to talk to you all under the theme entitled, I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting that. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your son. We, we thank you for this season that reminds us of the reason, not just for this season, but the reason that we live, move, and have our being. We are grateful for the coming of Christ, and we are looking forward to his soon return. Be with us, God, as we discuss the life of Jesus Christ today. Be with your manservant and let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight and your sight alone. A Men and amen. Christmas, family, is a time of high expectations. During the season, there is so much to be expected. We expect the decorations to come out nice and stay intact. We expect our children to be on their best behavior. We expect our spouses to treat us better. We expect our pastors to preach their best sermons. We expect our packages to arrive on time. We, we expect traditional movies to be watched and family games games to be played. We expect a good holiday meal and the cook expects you to eat that good holiday meal. Come on, somebody. The, the host expects all the invitees to come on time. This is a season of high expectations. At the same time, though, this is a season of high disappointment. It's time. It's the day after Christmas and the plans you had didn't come through the way you wanted them to. The people you invited did not show up. You were limited to having 10 people or less when you're used to entertaining a tribe. The food did not come out how you planned and the gifts you received were not the ones that were on your list. How are you handling that unexpected gift that you did not put on your list? How long will it remain in the box? How long before you re-gift it and send it to another? Are you still mad at those people who didn't show up? Are you disappointed that your plans weren't as extravagant as you remember? Are you frustrated that your package is in UPS limbo? Have mercy. Our high expectations give rise to our greatest disappointments. Our, our high expectations give rise to our greatest disappointments. But 
family, they don't have to. No, they don't have to. As Christians, we should know a little bit about the beauty that can lie in unmet expectations because we serve a God who operates in unexpected ways. This holiday directs the mind or should direct the mind of many to the birth of Jesus Christ. And this is an event that is cocooned with the unexpected. Here, God's unexpected plan is on full display as he employs unexpected people to birth his son in an unexpected place so that an unexpected purpose might be fulfilled again. Here, God, during the the birth story of Jesus Christ, he he, he, he enlists, he employs unexpected people to, to birth his son in an unexpected place so that he might fulfill an unexpected expected purpose. What are you talking about, pastor? Well, let's go through the story a little bit. If you recall, often Mary is illustrated or portrayed as a young girl in her early to middle 20s. Someone who, though she is having her first child, looks age appropriate and therefore capable of raising a child. However, this depiction typically in cartoons and in movies is unfaithful to the cultural context of the day. Closer to the truth is that Mary was in her early teens at the time she was pledged to marry Joseph. It might be helpful for us to note that until the completion of the 11th year, a Jewish girl was considered a minor. But on her 12th birthday, she was considered to be of age. So Mary here is 12, 13, 14 year old. She's an inexperienced teenager who, in addition to her youth, was poor. Being a poor young female were qualities that should have and would have disqualified her from being the right person for this job in the eyes of people in her culture. No one expected Mary to be able to bear such an awesome responsibility. She could have been seen as immature. She could have been seen as unlearned. She could have been seen as too young and too careless. But what is amazing about this young girl who would have gone unnoticed in the eyes of her contemporaries, this this ordinary girl with these ordinary aspirations embarking on an ordinary marriage in the hopes of starting an ordinary life like the other girls her age, was uh, her spiritual maturity. That was what was remarkable about this young, ordinary girl. Oftentimes, we associate age with spiritual maturity, but spiritual maturity is not indicative of how old you are. Neither is it indicative of how much you know. In other words, how long you've been in the church and how much Bible knowledge you have obtained and can spew out of your mouth is not a sign of spiritual maturity. Maturity in God's sight has nothing to do with what you say, less to do with what what you know, and most, if not all, to do with what you do. Do you do what God has asked you to do? Do you love your enemies? Do you pray for those who despitefully use you? Do you speak truth and love? Have you identified the idols in your life and put them away? Do you act justly? Do you show mercy? Do you walk humbly? Do you do what God is asking you to do? to do, are you spiritually mature? This young, inexperienced, poor girl could have panicked at the thought that this event would destroy her reputation. An unmarried girl with a child would be subject of ridicule in her community. She could have been overcome with dread at the thought of having that conversation that she would have to have with Joseph and risk ruining her engagement. He had every right to divorce her, every right to publicly shame her and bring the consequence of death for this apparent scandal upon her. She she could have responded in fear to God thinking about all these things and said, no, Lord, not I choose another. For a fleeting moment, she she thinks of the implausibility of the situation and asks the angel how it is possible for her to have a child when she has never had sex. And the angel responds, it will come by the creative power of the Holy Ghost. Her her curious question, her, her fleeting thought 
floats away. No other question arise, no other doubt in her heart. All she does is respond in Luke 138 that I am the Lord's doule, I am the Lord's slave. And may it be done according to me to your word. I'll risk the ridicule, she said. I'll risk the divorce. I'll risk my life. I'll, I'll do as you ask and leave the consequences in your hands. Listen, family, this is a young, inexperienced, poor girl. Faithful men of God hesitated at God's call, but she responds, I am the Lord's slave. Moses responded to God's call by saying, I don't speak well enough. Jeremiah said, I'm not old enough. And John Jonah simply said, I ain't going. But this poor girl responds to God in the most miraculous way possible. She says, wherever you go, I will go. Whatever you say, I will do. I am your slave. May it be done to me according to your word. And this is the response of someone who is mature in God, someone who responds in faith and not fear, someone who is submissive to the will and to the way of God. And Mary's husband is just like her. Mary tells Joseph she is pregnant and not only is she pregnant, but that she, the cause of her pregnancy is not the seed of another man, but that the baby inside her was brought about by the seed planted by the spirit of the living God. And while Joseph could have responded harshly to her and called for the death penalty, which was in keeping with Jewish law, he chose mercy over justice. Let me say that again. He chose mercy over justice and sought to put her away quietly to keep her from the public embarrassment and to save her from the penalty of death. Joseph thought he had only two options. He thought that he could only get a quiet divorce or give her the death penalty, but God had a third option. He told him to marry that girl. And just as it was shameful to be found unwed with a child, it was equally humiliating to marry an unseemingly faithful woman. But when the angel of the Lord came to him in a dream and told him to marry Mary, as soon as he got up from his bed, the Bible says he did exactly what the angel asked and married that girl. This season, folks, is a season not only of high expectations, but it's a season of receiving packages. I received the package the other day, but the box was all beat up. The box was torn up. I was certain that the contents of my package were no good because of the way that the box looked. The box looked beat up and broken down, but to my surprise, the package was delivered intact. I realized that while the box was beat up, the sender had sent it wrapped in bubble wrap. Beneath the box was the key to assure the package arrived intact. Come on, somebody. God used the poor young vessels, Mary and Joseph. They looked raggedy. They looked beat up. They looked broken down. But God said, I don't need them to look the part for looks can be deceiving. He said, I don't need them to be rich because money is not everything. I don't need them to be boxed nicely. I don't need them to look intact on the outside. God said, within their contents, I need them to be filled with humility and fear filled with submission and filled with the spirit of willingness. That's why I would declare, that's what God would declare to be sufficient. The contents of these people to protect and deliver God's greatest gift to the world. Yes, they were ordinary. Yes, they were ideal. Yes, they came in an unexpected, broken down box. But God saw an opportunity in these two people to bring about something that was unexpected. God not, not, did not only bring about his thing through unexpected people, but, but God came to be born in an unexpected place. God chose the birthing place of his son to be in an unexpected place. Bethlehem was not a city of great reputation. It had a storied past, though. 
This was a town that served as the setting to the backdrop of the story of Ruth and Boaz. This was also the place where David was born and the place where he was anointed as king. And, and this was also the town where David's mighty men resided from time to time. This was once the important strategic and fortified city under the reign of David's grandson, Rehoboam. But despite its prominence in the past, its greatness had faded as the years passed by. In Bethlehem, there were no architectural marvels. There was no grand temple for worship, no immense theaters for entertainment, no well-dug aqueducts to ensure the consistent water supply and no mighty fortress to protect itself. Six miles north in Jerusalem was where all that could be found, but not in Bethlehem. In Bethlehem, during the time of Jesus, there were no notable human achievements, no well-traveled city. The city of David was no more than just a small village, not the place where people would have considered the birthplace of a king. His birth was not in an immaculate bed either. He was not born on a memory foam mattress. Sealy Postropedic was not his choice bed. There was no hospital bed. There was no mattress there. There were no padded quilts there. There was not even a mat. There was only a manger, a long wooden box with hay covered with insects, padded with bits of leftover food soaked in saliva from the cattle that ate from that place. This is where Jesus was born in an insignificant town in a crazy, unrealistic bed. This was not the ideal place for a king to be born. Its packaging was horrendous, but its contents were perfect. No, you could not boast of this little town. You could not boast of the human achievements because there were none. You could not say it was a place of great commerce because there was little. You could not say it was lively because it was quiet. It was not the center of political power. Neither was it the center of religious worship. It was poorly packaged unideal for a king, unimportant, but God filled this insignificant town with his presence and graced a dirty situation with his holiness. God chose to bring his son through unexpected people to be born in an unexpected place, but that's not it. God still has some more unexpected things to do in addition to using unexpected persons and coming to unexpected places. God came to fulfill an unexpected plan. Jesus Christ came as the Messiah, but Jewish culture shows that there were varying views on what the Messiah would come to do, on what the Messiah's purpose would be, on what he would accomplish. Many expected the Messiah to be a powerful physician who could cure every single disease and heal every single sickness, make all the blind see, make all the deaf hear, make all the lame walk, and make all the mute see. Others expected a powerful political pundit who would have the authority to gather all the Jewish people back to Israel, the military might to triumph over the enemies of Israel and its oppressors, the, the, the capable leader to bring an end to all wars and to influence to con and the influence to convert Gentiles to Judaism, the means to restore the wealth and luster of the Jewish nation, the architectural vision to restore the temple to its grandeur as it was in the time of Solomon and the power to rule with superhuman abilities and superhuman qualities. They expected a Messiah that would be king of the world and raise them, the Jewish nation, to primary prominence under his kingdom. However, the purpose of the anointed one was not to defeat all the enemies of the world. His purpose was not to heal every disease. His purpose was not to cure every sickness. His purpose was not to restore all brokenness. His purpose was not to fill every wallet. His purpose was not to restore a people group to its prominence, not to liberate a nation from the grip of its oppressors, not to make sure everyone was living comfortably in this world of peace or in a world of peace. He came to do something far greater. 
He came to do something that was in the back of the minds of many. He, he came to make sure that we could enjoy something much more than just earthly prominence, much more than just great physical health, much more than just comfortable earthly living. He came to save his people from their sins, to save them from their hatred, to save them from their anger, to save them from their hostility, to save them from their pride, to save them from their favoritism, to save them from their elitism, to save them from their neglect, to save them from their idolatry, to save them from their adultery, to save them from their thievery, to save them from their neglect and save them from themselves. God came to fulfill this unexpected purpose so that persons young and old, great and small, could have the opportunity to experience the blessing of eternity. The anointed one will bring liberation. The anointed one will restore health. He will provide wealth. He will wipe every tear from our eyes. He will defeat death forever. He will put an end to mothers holding their dying children in their arms. He will put an end to pain and distress that leads to tears. He, he will be the Messiah that we all want. But before he can be the Messiah that we all want, he first has to be the Messiah that we all need. Prominence is the residue of salvation. Wealth is the residue of salvation and health is the residue of salvation. But you cannot experience the residue of salvation, the side effects of salvation until the reign of his grace washes you and prepares you for the eternal blessings that he wants to give you. Listen, family, God came through unexpected people to an unexpected place to fulfill an unexpected purpose. For this reason, he wanted to show us that anybody could be used by God. He wanted to show us that anyone can have access to God. And he wanted to illustrate what matters most to God. In other words, God does not place value on us because of our prominence or because of our talent or because of our giftedness or because of our wealth. The, the only thing that you and I need on our resume to be employed by God is a submissive heart and a willing spirit. That's all we need. You don't need to sing well. You don't need to preach well. You don't need to talk well. You don't even need to walk well. You just need to be willing to be used by God. And so that opens the door for everybody to receive his grace and be used by his power. God does not need our situation to be illustrious either. He does not need our circumstance to be neat and tidy. Jesus was born in an undistinguished town in an animal's food bowl. God's not bothered by the insignificance of your story. He's not put off by the mess in your life. He he was born in the saliva of animals that ate from their food bowl. He's not concerned with how bad you have messed up. He wants to bring his presence to you if you are willing. Finally, God may not bring down the walls of injustice like you want him to. He may not end world hunger. He may not house all the impoverished. He may not heal everyone from their poor health on this side of heaven. He may not even bring an end to plagues, but on the other side of heaven, you better believe that justice will reign. You better believe that food will be plentiful. You better believe that housing will be covered, that sickness will be no more, that health will be restored, that plague will be unheard of. But first, first, God has to make sure that you are right with him. Jesus is calling family. He already made provision for you and I. He already made provision for our salvation. So the question now is, is your calling and election sure? Don't harden your heart because God is not meeting your expectations. Don't, don't turn away from God because he did not show up in the way that you wanted him to show up. God needs to do something for you 
right now so that you may benefit from what he has in store for you in the sweet by and by. He's going to give you what you want, but he's first got to take care of what you need. Jesus is calling. Lay aside your expectations and allow Jesus to bring salvation into your ordinary life. Allow him to employ your ordinary circumstance, your ordinary situation, your ordinary being. Allow him to be a presence in your mess and watch how this anointed one provides you with more than you could have ever imagined. God will do the unexpected. But he does it so that we can have everything that we need and more. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the unexpected. As uncomfortable as it can be for us, God, we, we realize as we continue to go through this story that our expectations don't always align with your plan. The things that we want now, God, don't translate it to eternity. And so you're trying to get us to understand that what we need is you. What we need is your salvation. What we need is your grace. And even if you don't heal us, even if you don't bless us in the way we think we need to be blessed, God, Help us to understand that what you're giving us right now, the ceiling that you're placing on our hearts right now, will in turn benefit us in receiving the eternal rewards that you have for us. Help us to keep our eyes on the kingdom of God. Help us to keep our eyes on the agenda of God. Help us to keep our eyes on what you have in store and submit to the unexpected so that you can do what you need to do so that you can bring us through this dry and weary land. God, we thank you for your son. We thank you for his salvation that is promised to us. And we pray, God, that we get out of the way, that we lower our expectations so that he can use us ordinary people, use our in uh, unordinary situations and messy situations to bring about his good and perfect will in our lives. Help us, God, and forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, God, so that we can be set up for the eternal benefit the residue of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. What a wonderful message to carry us through the week, Lord. May you be filled with the wonder of Mary, the obedience of Joseph, the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the determination of the Magi, and the peace of Christ's child. May the Almighty God, Father, and Holy Spirit, and the Son bless you now and forevermore. Amen.